Hi, uh, this is Bob Westervelt. Um, I'm uh, uh, happy to introduce Joshua uh, Yang today, who will be telling about a, an exciting new field for parallel uh, computing for AI and machine learning. Uh, and that's based on uh, memristors, where the resistor actually remembers its previous uh, state and sort of a combination of a memory element and a processor. Um, uh, Professor uh, Yang got his uh, doctoral degree at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and they went on to uh, HB Labs, where uh, a lot of the initial uh, memristor work uh, was done between 2007 and 2015. Then moved on to the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, uh, and then uh, recently was appointed in 2020 at USC. Uh, so we're very happy to have him here, and I, I look forward to his talk. Uh, many thanks for the introduction, Bob. Uh, yeah, and uh, also thank you for organizing and the kind of invitation and to talk about our work um, on memory stable materials for computing. So as uh, the title um, suggests, it, I'm going to first um, briefly introduce memory stiff materials and the devices, just for those who are not familiar with this topic. Then I'm going to mainly focus on uh, how to use such devices for computing. The computing I'm going to talk about are mainly bio-inspired computing uh, rather than quantum computing. So um, let's first look at uh, you know, the background. So basically the challenges facing the future of computing. Um, first at device level, we know Moore's law is coming to an end, right? So TSMC is working on uh, three nanometer technology node and you know, how far this can still you know, go. Um, that's one um, big uh, constraint, the Moore's law. Um, and the second one is uh, the memory wall. Basically, it is uh, the performance difference between uh, memory and the processor is keep increasing. So basically memory development is behind and still behind and the, the gap is increasing actually. And the third is uh, the standard scaling law has ended about 10 years ago, which means even if we can keep cramming more devices on the chip, but we cannot turn all the devices on simultaneously because the power density is not scaling anymore. The power density increasing uh, quickly. And if we turn on all the devices simultaneously, we're going to burn the chip. That's why we keep um, some part of silicon dark. It's dark silicon. Right? So those are at a device level, the challenges. At architecture level, the challenge is as big, if not bigger. Actually, that is the Van Norman bottleneck. We know our traditional computer is built based on Van Norman architecture, which features um, the uh, separate memory and processor units. So you store your information in the memory unit, when you need to process it, you take it to the processor, get it processed, send the result back to store here, you take the next piece of information to process. This was perfectly fine in the past when computing did not involve a lot of data. But nowadays it is uh, uh, um, the big data era and the, most of computing is data centric then shuttling a lot of data constantly between, between the two units costs a lot of time and energy. And this is a sequential process. It doesn't help to process a lot of data. And also it's an analog system, a digital system. Our world is analog. So you need to convert analog into digital then get processed. The conversion between analog and digital is also known to cost a lot of time and energy. So in order to deal with uh, this problem for processing a lot of data, uh, we learn from uh, um, the most efficient tool uh, known for doing this so far, that is uh, the human brain. And the brain can be viewed as a network of neurons. So you store the data in the network and you process the data where it is stored. So it is in-memory computing. You do not need to shuttle data anymore. 
And also the computing can happen everywhere simultaneously in the network. It is a parallel computing instead of sequential. And uh, also it can deal with analog data directly. It is analog computing. So with these three components together, you're going to have a very efficient computing accelerator to deal with big data. There's more actually, the brain is also known to be very efficient in learning. It can learn with very low energy consumption with very few examples because it uses some neuron science principles um, to do that. If the artificial devices we built to make the artificial neural network can also implement such neural science principles, then it is hopeful to get advanced intelligence and something may be close to natural intelligence eventually. So in order to um, implement such a new computing paradigm, we need a new type of devices. Memory safe devices turn out to be uh, one of uh, the leading candidates. Um, so using memory safe devices for computing has been the research focus of my group uh, in the last few years. Uh, some of our major results um, are summarized here, which can be categorized into three groups. In the first group, we are trying to just build a, a machine learning accelerator. So trying to uh, get a higher energy efficiency and a higher throughput. In the second category, we're trying to build a more faithful artificial synapse, artificial neurons, artificial dendrites, and so on and so forth. We put them together to form um, a more faithful uh, artificial neural network. Um, hopefully that can lead to uh, advanced intelligence. And then in the third category, we're trying to just build a, a tool set for intelligent system. For example, here you're seeing um, a single device, a pressure, a pressure sensor, and talking with a single device and that is a processor. So basically you can have uh, two nano devices in principle to form the most compact sensing system, something like that. And now let me switch gear, um, briefly introduce some memory safe devices, um, which is um, also called RM um, when it is used for memory application. But for memory application, what we care are mainly the static ending states of the switching. But for computing application, as you will see, um, for some type of computing, we also needed to use uh, the dynamic process of the switching. So the memorist is uh, a dynamic device um, that is uh, the emphasis um, uh, to be made, you know, uh, different from um, RM. Um, so the device itself has a very simple structure. It has a, a, a functioning dielectric layer uh, with two electrode, metallic electrode, the functioning a layer could be oxide, nitride, sulfide, uh, a lot of type of uh, dielectrics. The structure is simple, but it has rich materials, physics, chemistry, electrical issues, which give us a, a rich device behavior for different applications, but it also gives us the headache in understanding the device mechanism in controlling them for real applications. For real application, we usually use a crossbar structure like this. And here you're looking at a 17 of uh, um, such crossing point device. At each crossing point, you have one device. If you cut the device open, look at the cross section vertically, you can see uh, you have a thin dielectric layer with two metallic electrodes. If you apply electrical bias between the two electrodes, you are going to introduce some change in the materials. And such change can lead to either capacitive change or resistance change. And the resistive change um, will uh, lead to something uh, like this. It's a hysteria resistance loop in the current voltage plot, which is a signature of memristor. 
and you follow this IV curve initially, the device in the off state with low current and at a threshold voltage, device is turned on, then it follows this curve become conductive. If you want to change the device back, you can use opposite voltage. When it is high enough, you switch the device back to high resistance again. So such type of switching has many promising uh, properties, such as uh, uh, it can happen really fast. We have shown that uh, we can switch device on and off repeatedly within 85 picosecond. And it is also very scalable. As you can see here recently, we made a device at a two nanometer by two nanometer size. And we even make a little crossbar array of that. So between on and off states, uh, it has many, many intermediate resistance levels rather than a binary. It has uh, um, it is multi-level and that's great for memory application and also for a synapse application. You want it to be analog. Uh, in addition to be scalable at 2D, it is also stackable in 3D. And as you can see here, we can stack the device on top of each other because they um, just need a amorphous or polycrystalline material. And so in this example, we stack eight layers of memory star to build a 3D neural network. And we even use that neural network to serve as a convolutional neural network to process video information. So there are other good properties such as CMOS compatibility, non-volatility, non-destructive reading, so on and so forth. I'm not going to uh, go into detail on that, rather i like to um, also talk about the challenges facing such a device for real application. The first one is uh, the mechanism understanding. So after years of study, believe it or not, actually there are still a lot of missing holes in the understanding of the switching mechanism. The reason it's so difficult is shown here. First, um, whatever changes during the switching responsible for the resistance change is buried underneath the top electrode. So it is invisible for um, some of the materials characterization tool. And also whatever changes in the material is localized both laterally and also vertically. It can be in a very tiny region. And to make it even harder, uh, such change can change location um, randomly. And so from switching cycle to cycle, the location can be different. And from device to device, the location can be different. So you all also know that this uh, uh, switching can happen within a really short time, like a, a sub 0.1 nanosecond. So all these together make the understanding or visualize the switching process very, very difficult. However, and different from memory application for computing application, as I mentioned, we want to understand the entire switching process. And we even want to use the, the switching process itself for computing. Um, so that requires some in situ characterization techniques with very high spatial and very high temporal resolution to um, visualize the process. Um, so this is um, very difficult, um, but after you know, many years of study, uh, we do have a decent understanding in some material systems, such as a model system, titanium oxide. So titanium oxide switch, um, shown here, you can view titanium dioxide as a, a semiconductor with wide band gap, 3 EV band gap, for example. As a semiconductor, it can have its own dopants. Um, in this case, the dopant can be oxygen vacancies. You know? um, so oxygen vacancies are known as untapped dopant. Um, it is positively charged. Different from the dopant in silicon, 
the, the oxygen vacancy dopant here, they are mobile. In the silicon, the dopants are immobile. Here, they are electrically mobile. You can move them, which is um, the, the, uh, the basis of the switching. So you have the doped region, which are conducting, and the undoped region, for example, at the metal semiconductor interface, you have a shaky like contact, which gives you high resistance. And that's why the entire device is in the off, resist, off state. So now if you want to change the resistance, you can use the electrical field to move the dopant, also dope the interface region and, uh, and remove or reduce the shaky barrier. So you get uh, the conducting on state. And if you want to switch the device back, you use uh, opposite voltage, you move the vacancy back and clean this interface, recover the shaky left contact, you get to the off state again. So in this example, oxygen vacancies are the mobile dopant. You can use other types of mobile species. For example, you can use silver um, in silicon nitride oxide um, to build a diffusing memory. I'm going to talk about that later. And you can use other uh, mobile species such as ruthenium in oxide, which it turned out can give us a low current analog switching device. I, I do not have time to talk about that today. So basically the switching is a result of ionic motion and the combined effect of electric field, chemical potential, and the dual heating. Some oxide, such as titanium oxide, um, the electric field plays more important role. In other oxide, such as niobium oxide, um, dual heating play more important role in the switch. So under those driving forces, the ion motion can take a different mechanism. For example, um, the charged particles can be moved by electric field, we call it uh, drift. And the kinetic energy of electrons can move ion, we call it electron migration. And if you have an ion concentration gradient, at elevated temperature, the ion can move against the gradient, and that's fake diffusion. And uh, even the temperature gradient itself can move ions, that's thermal for reasons. So it is uh, not uncommon, actually, in a single memory store, multiple ion transport mechanisms uh, are at play. So that, again, gives us, of course, rich device behavior. Um, that's good, but also give us uh, um, the difficulty in understanding and controlling the device. Um, so there are other challenges, um, such as uh, if you use a device in a large crossbar array, in addition to memory store, you also need something called an access device um, to work with each memory store so that you can um, randomly select one device in the array to operate. And you need a selected device. I do not have time to go into detail, talk about selected device today. Um, rather, uh, for the crossbar arrays, I'm going to show you later in the examples, we use a transistor as a selector in the crossbar array. And another challenge is for computing application. We need uh, to engineer some desirable dynamics, such as ion diffusion dynamics for computing. I'm going to touch upon that in the next um, section, talking about um, how to use all the devices for computing. So now let's switch gear, talk about um, the bio-inspired computing with such devices. For um, such application, you can have different levels of bio-inspiration in it, very little or some and uh, a lot more bio component in the computing. I'm going to um, give an example in each case to talk about uh, the computing. First, um, let's look at those, the case with very little bio inspiration in it. In this case, the memory device uh, um, is just a resistor and they form a resistive network for computing. And uh, the goal for such uh, computing is to accelerate vector matrix multiplication. Uh, 
no other purpose, just to accelerate vector matrix multiplication, which may sound trivial, but actually it is a very, very big deal for machine learning because uh, uh, depending on the, the algorithm, actually most of the machine learning algorithm, uh, the computing effort over 80% or 85% of the computing in the machine learning algorithm um, is really vector matrix multiplication, which unfortunately is something our digital computer is not good at because uh, um, you know to um, compute vector matrix multiplication in the digital computer, what you do is uh, you multiply every element in the vector with every element in the matrix. And you do that one by one, then you add the result together to get the dot product. And if the matrix is large, it has many, many steps. And uh, more importantly, you store all the computing parameters in the memory. And during computing, you need to frequently visit the memory, fetch the data, which costs a lot of time and energy. However, if you do this uh, in the memory to cross bar array, you can finish a vector matrix multiplication within one computing cycle, uh, regardless of the matrix size. So this is how you do that. You can program the conductance of each cell in the array to represent the mathematical value in the matrix to be multiplied. So um, then you can also use the amplitude of the input voltage to represent the mathematical value in the vector to be multiplied. So to perform a vector matrix multiplication, you just need to apply the voltage to the rows simultaneously, and then you collect the current here. That is the dot product. That's your computing result. Because uh, um, at each crossing point, you can see you have a voltage applied to a conductor, you get a current here. The current is really the multiplication result of the voltage and the conductance. In other words, um, Ohm's law has done the multiplication for us. It happens everywhere simultaneously. If you collect the current here, you are adding those current together simultaneously. In other words, Kirchhoff's current law has done the accumulation for us. So basically you apply voltage, you collect the current here, you get your computing result within one computing cycle. So this can um, is really in-memory computing, parallel computing and analog computing. That's why it can lead to all those magnitude improvement in speed and energy. Um, you know, to demonstrate this, we build our hardware. This is um, the, the uh, wafer and zoom in of the circuit, zoom in of each cell. It has a transistor as a selector combined with the memory in series. So we can freely program the array to something like what you just saw. The pattern is a DCT, a discrete cosine transform operator. You can use those to perform linear algebra acceleration. Um, so for example, you can do image compression. This is the original image. They say the image compressed um, using the crossbar array I just showed you experimentally. And to compare, we also compress the image with software uh, to the same compression ratio. As you can see, they are quite comparable. So this is cool. It is much more efficient to um, perform computing. But again, like I said, uh, the memory state here is nothing but a resistor array, right? So um, in fact, the memory state can do more. It's more than a resistor array. For example, it can be electrically reprogrammed. In other words, it can perform some sort of learning in the network. Um, so those are higher level of bio-inspiration you need. And uh, um, let's first uh, look at what are the key ideas for bio-inspired computing. Um, the, the brain again can be viewed as a network of neurons connected by the synapse. And uh, then when a synapse um, are active, we call it fire. And when 
it will send signals to its neighbors. And if there is a neuron such as this one, it receives more signals from its neighbor itself become active or it fire. Um, if two neurons such as these two, they are active around the same time or they fire around the same time, the connection between these two becomes stronger. So it's called a oh, fire together, wire together. This is believed to be a, a fundamental learning rule in the uh, biological neural network. Um, it's the high beam learning rule. Uh, a specific variant of it is the spiking timing, spike timing dependent plasticity STDP learning rule. So now suppose these neurons are active when you see a fluffy animal with big eyes, small ear and a pointed face. And around the same time, if someone like your mom says cat, um, this will excite uh, additional neurons such as this one. And those neurons are active around the same time, the connection between them becomes stronger. And uh, next time when you see a similar animal, this neuron will fire quickly to help you to recognize it. So if it is a, a dog, it's probably associated, associated with a, uh, a slightly different group of neurons. So in this way, the neural network gradually learning um, by changing the connection strengths between the neurons um, with uh, examples in, as an input. So using similar ideas, um, we're trying to train our um, crossbar memory stiff network as a neural network to recognize patent such as the handwritten digits. So in order to do that, we first partition the crossbar array we build into two layers of neural network. And the output of the second layer has uh, 10 neurons corresponding to the 10 handwritten digits. Then we can convert the pixels of the picture into analog voltage to serve as the input to the first layer of the neuron. Because uh, initially these synaptic weights or memory resistance here are random to begin with. Regardless of those input, these 10 neurons fire randomly. So now we can use some algorithms such as backpropagation to figure out how to change the synaptic weights here, then manually change it by switching the memory stars so that whenever the input is zero, the first neuron fire, whenever the input is one, the second neuron fire, so on and so forth. Uh, we train the neural network uh, with many examples, such as a thousand example, 10,000, more than that. I'm using those examples to train the network by switching the uh, memory stars in the network. And uh, as you can see, um, eventually after thousands and thousands of training examples, the network become pretty good at recognizing unseen patterns, um, you know, similar handwritten digits with over 90% of accuracy. And so using similar idea, this could be very useful. And in addition to the image compression, the uh, pattern classification, you know, we also use it um, as a, a convolutional neural network for video processing. We use it as a long short-term memory network uh, uh, to accelerate a gate classification. And we also use it as a convolutional long short-term memory network, also use it to accelerate reinforcement learning so on and so forth. So these are cool and powerful, but it also have problems, right? As uh, you already seen that uh, the training, uh, the, the learning uh, is very costly. You need uh, many, many uh, extra computing to figure out how to change the synaptic weights. And you need uh, many, many examples to train the network and um, using a supervised learning approach. 
So we know our brain can do much better. We only need a few examples to learn. And also uh, we do not uh, you know, have the weight calculation, then, then, then change it, the synaptic weight in a supervised way. Rather, we believe in the brain, uh, we are learning in the, the neural network is changing in a more like unsupervised way. Um, so in order to um, make the learning more efficient, um, uh, we need something more than just a non-volatile memory. And uh, so far in the two examples, we know Memorist is a non-volatile memory and uh, it's a reconfigurable memory, that's it. Uh, but in order to perform more advanced functions such as unsupervised learning, we need the device to be more capable, more than just a non-volatile memory. Um, so we learn from the biological device, such as the, the biological synapse to see what features we need in order to perform more advanced function. So one thing we learn as shown here, uh, you know, the, this is a synapse with the pre-neuron, post-neuron, the synaptic widths are really how many ion channels or how conductive uh, a, of each channel. So that's the synaptic width. It's more like the non-volatile memory component here. But in order to um, change the synaptic width in the synapse, um, it needs to go through a dynamic process. Um, so it goes like this. Um, you need a pre-spike, uh, which needed to be large enough that can uh, open the so-called NMDA channel, ion channel. Once this ion channel is open, um, then the calcium ion can diffuse through that channel, go into the post neuron. This is the diffusion process and diffusion. Once the calcium get into here, it can trigger some bioactivities to install more ion channel or make the existing ion channel more conductive basically update the weight. But before getting here, you need to go through this dynamic process. As you can see, the process is controlled by some diffusion of ions. So in other words, in, order to the, uh, in addition to the non-volatile memory, we also need another component um, in the synapse to control the dynamics. It's better to be a diffusion dynamics. So uh, do we have such a device? Um, if we think about a memorista, actually there is one type of memorista we developed, we call it a, a diffusive memorista, and it has the, the diffusion dynamics we need. Um, this video shows uh, uh, at an atomic level what's going on um, inside of the diffusive memorista. You have the two electrode, you have a silver doped in silicon nitride oxide. When you apply electrical bias, you can see the silver are moving and eventually form a complete ion channel. And uh, after that, when you remove electrical bias, the silver actually go back, the ion channel breaks. So you may not see that clearly in the video. Um, you can see better in the snapshots here. So initially between the two electrodes, um, there's a gap and uh, the current between the two electrodes is very low when you apply electrical bias. But uh, uh, over uh, you know, accumulation, you can see uh, silver uh, moving and uh, um, those are silver moving into the gap. And at this moment, silver form a complete channel bridging the top and the bottom electrode and the current jump to a high level. And uh, uh, the channel size is about four nanometer in diameter. So after this electrical bias is removed, from this moment, you can see under zero electrical bias, the silver um, conduction bridge actually break, breaks by itself. The silver ion move back and eventually it form a sphere uh, shape here uh, from a filament to sphere and zero electrical bias. We know that's a diffusion process and the driven by the interfacial energy minimization between silver and the dielectric material. So this dynamics can help us um, to build a, 
more faithful synapse. Um, so we uh, integrate that diffusive memory star um, into this device uh, that's a non-volatile memory star. So these two combine to form a synapse with dynamics. So with such dynamics, uh, as shown by those electrical measurement data, the device can naturally reproduce uh, the uh, short-term plasticity behavior observed in the uh, biosynapse long time ago. It's quite complex, uh, short-term plasticity, but it can be naturally reproduced by such device. And for the long-term plasticity, especially the spike time-independent plasticity, um, with the dynamics, the device can naturally um, show such behavior without the need of playing tricks in uh, the input signal or overlap the, the uh, input spikes uh, or change spike shape or something like that. You can just do it like uh, what you do in the bio system, give it spike to the synapse, it will naturally um, show the STDP learning behavior. And that's synapse. And in order to build an artificial neural network, we also need neurons. And we know the main function of neuron is to generate a action potential like this. Um, so initially, you have the ATP pump that can pump sodium ion out of the membrane and uh, um, pump potassium ion in the membrane. So you have a sodium ion gradient um, across the membrane, you have opposite gradient for potassium ion across the membrane. And um, you pump every three sodium ion out, and you get two potassium ion in. So eventually you have a net negative potential inside of the membrane. So that's the resting um, potential. And now if you have uh, um, input uh, electrical stimuli, and you can see the membrane potential gradually increase. Once it's over a threshold, it suddenly opens the voltage control, the sodium ion channel. And once this ion channel is open, sodium ion flood into the membrane driven by the concentration gradient built by ATP pump. Then a sodium ion goes in and your membrane potential increases dramatically. And then sodium ion channel close even before it closes, the potassium ion channel opens and potassium ion flood out of the membrane, also driven by its concentration gradient. Um, so you, the sodium ion, potassium ion go out, the, um, the membrane potential drop, you can have an overshoot here. And then the potassium ion channel close and under ATP pump, the um, neuron goes back to its resting state after this firing process. So this turned out this process can be uh, closely uh, mimicked by the um, diffusion memory um, case. You can see um, from here to here, it emulated the process of accumulation and channel still um, is closed. And at this moment, uh, after you, know, you accumulate over the threshold, the end channel suddenly open and the, you have a high current it's like the ion channel open process. After this, uh, without electrical bias, you can see uh, the sodium, um, the, the silver, silver uh, goes back and the ion channel uh, close automatically, driven by the diffusion um, and the minimization of individual energy. So basically we can use the diffusion memories to, to mimic the um, ion channel in the, uh, neuron, and we can use a capacitor to uh, mimic the uh, membrane capacitor here. So this capacitor can be an uh, intrinsic capacitor of the diffusion memory star, and it can also be an external capacitor. So with these two, and we can build an artificial neuron, and the electrical measurement data here shows uh, this artificial neuron can have uh, the um, very nice uh, um, leaky integration and the fire function, um, as can be seen by those electrical testing data. So now we have a, a more faithful synapse, more faithful neurons. We can build a, a neural network by putting them together. 
uh, experimentally, and we have this uh, uh, small neural network. Even though it is small, but with the more advanced uh, synaptic neuron, neuronal functions, it can already perform something amazing, such as unsupervised learning. So in order to demonstrate unsupervised learning, we need two of such uh, neural network. So the first layer has uh, many um, convolutional layer. Each column is a, a kernel. The first layer serves a convolutional layer with those kernels um, at each column. So those kernels can extract features from the input pattern. And those extracted features are represented by the firing pattern of the output neurons. And such output firing pattern of the first layer serve as the input uh, to the second layer of neural network. The second layer of neural network has three neurons. In this case, we're trying to use three neurons to classify four input patterns. Initially, because the synaptic weights here are random, regardless of the input, these three neurons fire randomly. And if it is a supervised learning, we would use a backpropagation to figure out how to change the synaptic weights then manually change them. But for unsupervised learning, we don't do that. In fact, we don't do anything but repeating those input. Let the network evolve by itself through the dynamic interaction between the synapse and the neurons. So they sort of um, perform self-organization uh, through the helping lack learning role. So as you can see, uh, with each input, the synaptic widths change gradually. And after only 30 cycles of training, the synaptic widths um, evolve to a degree so that whenever the input is uh, a, the third neuron fire, not random anymore. Whenever the input is S, the second neuron fire. Whenever the input is U and M, the first neuron fire. So it turned out this small neural network thinks U and M are close enough to be put in the same category. So this is a, a small um, neural network uh, and it already show very encouraging result once we add the um, the neuromorphic dynamics into the device. Um, so this is a baby step, but uh, um, uh, it uh, indicate, you know, th this um, is going to be quite uh, uh, exciting along this uh, direction. So um, I'm going to use a couple of slides to summar uh, summarize uh, the, some of the ideas. So we know CMOS, um, are very powerful. You can use it to build almost anything, including neural network. Um, but the CMOS device were not created or optimized for this purpose. It's not efficient. Uh, it takes um, about 10 transistors to simulate, not even emulate uh, a synapse. It takes even more transistors to simulate a neuron. But we have a lot of synapse and neurons in the brain if you do a rough calculation to uh, simulate all the synapse and the neurons in the brain, uh, you would need uh, more than 10 million uh, the state of the art chips. So this is um, obviously not practical if possible at all. So fortunately we have those emerging devices as we have seen such as a diffusive memory store or drift memory store, uh, you only need a couple of such devices to emulate a neuron or synapse. And such a device uh, um, can be even smaller than the biological synapse and neurons. Um, so this uh, could be a um, promising um, approach. So the reason the CMOS devices um, um, are not very suitable for this purpose is shown here. If we think about our CMOS device, um, it's silicon uh, defined by the uh, dopant profile. The dopant profile are really ions, right? And but those are the static ions. They do not move after fabrication. During electrical operation, you're not moving ions. You are moving electrons, which, which is fast, but volatile. It's good for logic, but not for memory. 
Um, so since the hardware are not changing during learning, the learning is really software learning. And uh, this is very different from the biological system. Um, we, so now imagine if we can mobilize those ions electrically, so we can move those ions to change the dopant profile to get different type of devices on fly during learning. So that will actually open a window for almost infinity opportunities. Um, now we have a new type of devices, just like a memory stuff. So here we are manipulating ions, which is slow, but non-volatile. It's better for memory application. And uh, during the, the learning, um, you have the hardware are changing. It, we can really realize the hardware learning and the dynamics of the ion motion is very similar to the dynamics of the ion motion in the biological system, which play very important role for the process uh, in the biological neural network. So the similarity may eventually uh, allow us to approach something like the natural intelligence. So here the caveat is that even though we know how to precisely control the position of the ion during the fabrication process, after decades uh, of study and the development, we do not really know how to precisely reconfigure the dopant electrically yet. So that is um, challenging. That need to be solved in the future um, to develop uh, the post CMOS devices. And on the other hand, if you think about the devices in the brain, they are pretty lousy devices. They are um, slow, they are big, they are stochastic, they are inaccurate, and yet they can perform amazing computing. That is because they have uh, their suitable corresponding architecture and algorithms to work with those neurons. So the co-design between the, the device and the architecture algorithm are critical. In order to do that, we needed to understand better how the brain works, which uh, we have very limited knowledge so far. That is another thing um, really need a breakthrough uh, in the future. Um, okay, so the, I guess the take home message, uh, the big data era give us the challenges um, in the computing. Um, but also give us opportunities um, to develop unconventional computing paradigm. Uh, so you need new devices for the unconventional computing. Uh, there are a number of candidates, memory stick devices uh, is one, uh, which can be fast, scalable, stackable, analog, and the promising for bio-inspired computing. And the switching mechanism um, of the memory stick device is very different from the CMOS device because it involves the migration of uh, mobile ions. And um, so th there are a lot of work need to be done in order to um, precisely control the ion motion electrically. Uh, and yet uh, we have um, demonstrated memory stick arrays that, can, uh, that have shown um, out of the magnitude, uh, higher uh, energy and uh, uh, throughput over the traditional CMOS approach. Um, so with some supervised learning and such a um, memory stable neural network can perform uh, the patent classification, can serve as LSTM, reinforcement learning, so on and so forth. And with a higher level of bio component in the device, and we can even see some more advanced learning, such as unsupervised learning that has already uh, been shown experimentally um, in the new type of memory neural network. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank my um, postdoctor students for doing the work, really, and my coworkers uh, uh, from a different institute. Uh, and also like to thank my uh, sponsors um, for supporting the work. And also I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer questions um, if you have any.
Okay, well, well thank you very nice, uh, very much for an interesting uh, talk. Um, for people who would like to ask a question, the way the software works is you need to type it into the chat and then I'll read them and, uh, and can answer them. Um, we have a few already. Uh, J.B. Uh, Groves says uh, the array you're speaking of is the massive parallel vector array. How large can the array be? Right, that's a very good question. So, um, so far, um, I think the, the largest array we have built is 256 by 256. Mm. That uh, is uh, already good for uh, many tasks, but uh, for a uh, even larger array, uh, you know, metrics, for example, you deal with, um, you can have a multiple core, uh, multiple uh, arrays uh, work together to deal with those. Um, so the reason um, we choose such size um, uh, on the one side, um, there are some device limitations. On the other side, um, it's also to keep the uh, balance of flexible and efficient uh, of uh, the, uh, the system. Uh, because uh, and in, case, in many cases, you're dealing with a smaller prob uh, problem. If you use a too large uh, array, you're wasting some resources not used. Um, but also on the other hand, um, uh, there are some limitation, you know, such as uh, um, the wire resistance in the array um, need to be uh, solved. Really, you, you need to make the device more resistant, much more resistant than, than the wire so that you can reduce the impact of the IR drop on the wire. Uh, so you make your uh, array larger. Um, so of course um, there are other, if you use the ADCDAC driving circuit, um, then um, how much current um, the ADCDAC can take per column or row is another limitation. So the short answer is uh, um, you have seen you know, many groups uh, um, doing one tornado by one tonate a race size like that. Uh, we have 256 by 256 at this moment. Um, I believe it can be make, uh, made larger um, in the future. Uh, at this moment, it's 256 by 256 with multiple arrays um, together to deal with larger problems. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question from uh, Yuan Vigo. Is it possible to design a memristor with semiconductors and liquid metals with magnetohydrodynamics, MHD at the uh, micro, micro scale level, uh, tin uh, gallium maintaining bio-inspired bio criteria? Question mark, what would be the problems to face with the case of MEMS with uh, MHD? Question mark. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I fully got this, uh, all the details of this question, uh, but uh, um, yeah, so uh, as long as you have uh, the iron motion and that in has an um, impact on your uh, electron transport, you get a memristor. And that, um, you know, as we've seen, uh, it has uh, uh, a lot of the similarity at a physical mechanism level uh, with the uh, biological system. Uh, I, I would think, um, you know, such system um, is interesting um, to, to explore. Um, although I don't know, you know, all the detail, um, it must have some advantage and disadvantage um, when you go into, you know, um, uh, the detail really doing it. Uh, so uh, I don't know if I answer the question here. Okay. Um, okay, well, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, a third question from Taiki Kim. According to Leon, uh, Leon uh, Chua's uh, definition, a memristor is a two terminal electrical component relating charge and magnetic flux. If we generate some charge difference in your memristic devices, could we measure magnetic flux difference? Question mark. Could we uh, experimentally measure the memristor value using these memristive devices? Um, yeah, so um, it is uh, a, a little bit uh, confusing, you know, in the original uh, uh, 
definition of the memory state, it, it is a flux. It's not necessary to be the magnetic flux. In fact, um, in those uh, devices, it does not really uh, has, uh, uh, has a magnetic component in it. It's just uh, uh, the uh, integration of the current is a charge integration, uh, uh, time integration of the voltage uh, lead to flux. Uh, so I do not think uh, we can really um, measure uh, some magnetic properties in, in most of the devices I have seen. Um, yeah, so what, what's the second part of the question? Uh, well, what would be the problems to, oh, excuse me, that's, I'm reading the wrong yeah. one. Uh -huh. Just a second. Um, mm -hmm. Could we experimentally measure the memristor value using these memristor devices? I think, yes. Yeah, yeah we, we can, yeah. So we, there are a lot of uh, properties we can measure, you know, uh, memoristic value, current voltage. Uh, uh, I doubt uh, magnetic uh, magnetization, something like that. Uh, no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Any last uh, questions? Uh, type quickly. Okay, I, I don't see any, but this is mm -hmm. very interesting uh, stuff that I've been following for a while, and you, you've really taken it uh, quite far. And so, a very interesting talk. Uh, Donnie says hi. <laughs> Donnie, yeah. huh? Yeah, and, so thank uh, you. Yeah, good, good to, to see you all. Yeah. And thanks, thanks very much. Okay, thanks. Yeah.